Seated. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Let me call your case. This is case CV 15564, United Financial Casualty v. Associated Indemnity. This is the time set for oral argument. Council, you both know you have 20 minutes for oral argument. Uh, Mr. Richards, you can set aside some time for rebuttal. Just let us know. Um, the proceedings are being recorded. They'll be uploaded to our court website so the public can view those can view these arguments, I want you to be aware of that. We've read everything, we're very familiar with the issues in the case, so keep that in mind as you make your arguments. Mr. Richards. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, counsel. As the court knows, this is a rather classic insurance dispute between an auto carrier and a CGL carrier. I, as appellant, represent the auto carrier in this case. It arises from an accident in Prescott in 2012 involving Dorothy Allen, in which she was injured. It's a case in which both insurance companies intervened in the tort action for purposes of combining discovery and uh, getting to the coverage issue. That discovery, we believe, ultimately leads to summary judgment. So my client files a motion for summary judgment. We're met with a cross motion for summary judgment. In the meantime, the case settles in the underlying case, and that's why there's only two parties before you today, one insurance company against the others. After settlement of the case, Judge Mackey uh, amended the pleadings and allowed the uh, insurance issue to proceed. Um, it's our position. I have our a question for you, counsel. Yes. In, in terms of that agreement, I know that... Um, I, I, I know that uh, Associated argues that there was an exclusion if there was coverage for auto, but if that exclusion didn't apply, were they conceding that there was coverage under the CGL policy and they would be responsible for indemnifying uh, the plaintiff in this case? Yes. I, I, as I understand, the record in this case should reflect, and counsel, I would hope, would verify that. There was no question one insurance company or the other was going to be on hook for the uh, settlement. It, it, and I, I think it brings us to an unusual state in this case, and I think that one that's framed and mentioned in the pleadings, uh, but I don't want it to be lost uh, it, it, because there's a lot of pleadings in this case. Uh, Associated argues that the complaint says the underlying plaintiff was dropped off in an unsafe place. And they say there's two ways, then, that this case can come out. Either the auto carrier is implicated because she was dropped off at, a, at an unsafe place, or there's no liability. And if there's no liability, they're not on the hook for that. It, they're, they're making an argument I think has essentially been waived by the parties, and that is the parties agreed to contribute to settlement with the sharing arrangement, reserving the issue who was on hook for it. And by doing that, we have an acknowledged indemnity obligation, which both parties acknowledge is resolved so by is, the yeah, terms of the, the insurance policy. This is pure legal version of a high-low agreement? In other words, uh, in, inherent in the agreement to, to fund the settlement is the notion that somebody's going to be on the hook, whether there was liability or not. Yes. And so they agreed to a temporary funding arrangement to fund the settlement, Reserving the coverage issues, and it's that coverage issue that was resolved here. But I, are any defense costs at issue in that agreement to fund the settlement? No, they're not, and that's why we've contended in our pleadings that the duty to defend is not really part of this case. Both insurance companies provided a defense. That defense obligation was resolved when the case was settled. Either party had the right at that time to make reimbursement of defense costs an issue in the case. Neither party chose to do so. So in other words, win or lose today, if we don't address any issues concerning the duty to defend, it will not leave the parties in a, uh, an ambiguous position. I, I, I can't say that entirely because uh, Appleese and their pleadings have said, well, perhaps defense costs should be part of a separate action. And we've actually argued that to, to, to the court. My contention is if defense costs was an issue, 
it's properly part of the deck relief action and should have been brought. Not having been brought, it's been waived. Uh, so I, but, but I think all this court has to do today is, uh, since there is no claim for reimbursement, is say that the duty to defend issue was mooted by the settlement in the case. And I think that resolves the issue. Nothing Judge Mackey did creates any financial obligation on any party. And I can't say it's put to rest finally because uh, Appley has suggested maybe they can bring a separate action. Uh, so it, it's our contention that having the two parties funded the settlement, we acknowledge there's an obligation there. Then the issue becomes which insurance policy pays for it. And the CGL policy, I contend, is a policy which is kind of inclusive, excuse me, of obligations aside from the exceptions. One exception is the auto coverage. So if you find that the injury to Ms. Allen did arise out of the use of an automobile, we're on the hook for it. If not, it's not a fair defense to that indemnity obligation to say, yeah, but they couldn't approve the case against our insured anyway because essentially anything the auto policy doesn't pick up, the CGL policy picks up. And it's for that reason uh, w we contend that once we deposited Ms. Allen in a safe pa place on the corner and she had fully disembarked from the vehicle, that our obligation was complete. And any negligence, any theory that they want to come up with, that's going to be the responsibility of the CGL carrier from that point forward. So she actually disembarked, got out of the vehicle, and walked across the sidewalk, and then fell on the lawn on the property? It, it, it was actually on a, a pile of snow about 8 to 10 feet from where she had been deposited. And the facts are essentially these. The van drives up. Ms. Allen suggests a spot. To, to the driver along the street. He sees a clear spot up ahead, goes there. She gets off in what everyone has agreed is a safe location. Three witnesses testified, Ms. Allen, Mr. Parsons, the bus driver, and the uh, independent witness, Vicki Tarantine. Dropped off there. The evidence is from Ms. Allen that she started stepping and the van pulled away. The driver says, she took two to four steps. I looked. I had a green light. I left. There is a dispute, in fact, because Vicki Turrentine says that the van was still there when the accident happens about 60 to 90 seconds after she or originally disembarked. Are, are you saying it took her 60 to 90 seconds to get eight feet? I, well, no. The, the snow pile is, I, I'm sorry, about eight to ten feet wide, I, I believe. But... And I, I may be incorrect on that. And, and I'll tell you, that's an issue we did explore in discovery. And, and obviously, Ms. Allen is not a youngster. Well, she was 92 if, years old. If, it's, if she's somebody who takes a minute to get eight feet, I mean, that, that's, that, that would be a, a severe uh, disability at that point. Um, is it possible? for a driver to safely just say, see ya, uh, if, if they're moving uh, that slowly. I mean, at, at that point, if, if, you, if you've got a passenger who you know is that disabled, um, doesn't the drop-off implicate the vehicle to a greater degree than it might with your typical Uber passenger? Uh, se several answers to that. Uh, uh, first of all, if the person is disabled, it's a different case. And, and there was affirmative evidence in this case that Ms. Allen was not uh, disabled. She walked normally. And, and to respond to, to uh, Judge Gould's question, the evidence indicates she took two to four steps initially. Then she hit the snow pile. And one of the things Ms. Turrentine indicated is when she was traversing the snow, she was taking very small steps. The difference between you and me is maybe 10 or 11 feet. If it took a minute to get that far um, under any conditions, wouldn't that be indicative of some special circumstances? Um, it could, depending on the circumstances. I would assert in this case 
No, because of the affirmative evidence from Dorothy Allen that she suffered no physical disabilities at all, that the driver asked her if there were any concerns, whether she needed any assistance, she said no. Uh, the fact that there was affirmative evidence that the she was taking small steps on the snow pile, which was some comfort to Ms. Turrentine because she, she didn't believe she should be on the uh, pile to start with. Uh, and, and to further answer your question, the, the cases do go there. This court is aware from the briefing, there are cases carved out for children. The Davis case from North Carolina is one. Uh, for adults, there is a case that the court has in Tagon, which was a case where someone was about two days away from their death. They were being brought home essentially for a form of uh, hospice care, and they were non-ambulatory. In that case, when the driver put the decedent in a wheelchair and, and did a bad job of trying to get her upstairs backwards in the wheelchair, uh, during which time she suffered an injury, the court said the auto policy did apply. So there, there is a line there. There are some authorities which would, would support the fact if we're dealing with a disabled person or a young child, it's a different case. So, so then is this really an appropriate case for summary judgment at all? I think it is in the sense, and the only stumbling block to summary judgment that we found at all was the dispute in fact as to whether the van driver was there or not. For indeed, two witnesses suggested he was gone. One suggested the van was still there. At the trial court level, both parties agreed they didn't believe that fact governed coverage at all. Um, and if the court is suggesting that perhaps we should have uh, had testimony on Ms. the extent of Ms. Allen's disability, we believe those facts were stipulated and they're clear in the record. The only bad fact suggesting a disability is purely her age. As I recall at the time she was deposed, she was 92 years old. But all the testimony was she was a very unusual woman who was physically active, walked on her own, did things herself. She was still driving her own automobile. She decided not to that morning because it had snowed. But we think the record is clear. Disability so you, is not a part of this case. So the specter that your description raises of somebody walking so, so slowly that it takes 10 seconds per foot um, is just not a fact genuinely in dispute on this record. Is that your contention? I think the facts were admitted because at that time, Remember, there's only one witness. When I say the facts are disputed of how she was traversing the snow pile, Ms. Allen essentially testified she took those first couple steps out of the vehicle, and then she doesn't know what happened. And whether it's amnesia after the fact or whether she suffered some event, we don't really know. The bus driver says, I watched her take two to four steps. She was still in the clear. And then I pulled away, and I wasn't aware of the accident until someone told me about it later in the day. So Vicki Turrentine was, was the only witness, and I think, frankly, the parties were stuck accepting what she said. But she does talk about the very slow movement, which provided, as I say, comfort to her in the sense uh, uh, that she thought she was being as careful as she could. On the other hand, she was quite alarmed that she was walking over a pile of snow. But you're, you're, uh, you've, you've argued here today and in your briefs that uh, it's undisputed it was a safe location where she was dropped off. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And, and the reason I say that, the, the evidence that had no counter from any of the witnesses was that she was dropped off in a spot clear of snow on the sidewalk. She could have walked to the right up the sidewalk. She could have walked a few feet to her left and around the snow pile, so she had two avenues uh, that, that were clear to the doctor's office to which she was going. And, and unless there's some questions now, I think I would like to reserve the rest of my time. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. All right, Mr. Warshak, your argument? I'll be arguing, Your Honor. Shanks Lenhart. Shanks Lenhart. Okay, Mr. Lenhart, your argument? 
Yeah. May it please the court. My name is Shank Slenhardt. I'm counsel for the Apple E Associated Indemnity Corporation in this matter. Uh, as Mr. Richards explained, this is an insurance coverage dispute. Um, and what that really is is just a contract interpretation case. There's two contracts here. One is an automobile liability policy that provided coverage for matters arising out of the use of a shuttle van that the insured operated. The other contract is my client's contract, which is a general liability contract that covers the operation of the apartment complex. But with and the employees that work for the complex. Employees, and, but importantly, within that contract is an exclusion that excludes matters arising out of the use, ownership, maintenance, supervision, training, or entrustment of a vehicle. Let, let me ask you a question then. You heard my first question to Mr. Richards when he got up. It, it, by funding this agreement and entering into this agreement to pay for the, the injuries in this case, were you conceding that if this exclusion for the use of the automobile did not apply, that the CGL policy covered the injuries in this case? It was a covered occurrence. <clears throat> yes, Your Honor, I believe that's accurate. Both carriers disputed which the policies would apply. I think the understanding was they agreed to fund the settlement based on Defense Counsel's recommendation um, and leave the issue of which of the two policies would cover it to the coverage action. Is it undisputed that she was dropped off in a safe place? Uh, I do not believe that is undisputed. I think that uh, counsel is parsing the testimony a little bit uh, incorrectly. Witnesses testified that the area she was dropped was clear of snow. I think that is undisputed. The sidewalk area she stepped out onto did not have snow. But Ms. Allen and her attorney never at any point in time agreed that she was dropped in a safe location. And I think the question this court has to ask to resolve this coverage dispute is a simple one, and that is, what was the only potential liability exposure to the insured in this case? And that's paragraph 23 of the complaint, and that was negligence based on dropping her in an unsafe location to disembark from the van. Ms. Turntine testified that the location in which she was dropped put her in a position where, while she had other avenues to go, the straightest line from her spot to the door took her over a snow pile. And so that was, the, that was the only claim in the case. But wouldn't that be the negligence of the driver then? I mean, how's that the use of the vehicle? How does that tie in? If, if a person is dropped off, they walk out of the vehicle, across the sidewalk, and fall down, uh, no matter how long it takes them to get there, how does that uh, fall under the use of a vehicle coverage uh, provision? Uh, can you can you cite me a single case that has held use uh, held that to fall under the use coverage of, I, I think of an that, auto policy in in the entire country? Yes, I think that you'll see the the, the Chavez case, the um, which is a disembarkation embarkation case. Tell me about to, the Chavez case. That's the case where, here in Arizona with the school bus, where you had children uh, coming onto the bus at the time in which the accident occurred, and the in court that case, held they were lined up, right? Sure. When the, when the accident occurred, they were lined up because they were trying to get on the bus and they were impeded from doing so because of the slow movement of the line. Their, their aim was the bus, not some post-bus destination. So sure, that's an embarkation case, so they're getting onto the vehicle. The, the case out of North Carolina that counsel referenced, the Davis case, that's one where you've got a disembarkation, a parking of a van, and, and someone going out across the street. And then, of course, the question is, how long does disembarkation last? I disembarked from a vehicle this morning, but if I, I, if I fall on my way to my office, that I don't think that's a disembarkation case. I agree. There is some outer limit, um, which we could hypothetically talk about, at which the, 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 the arising out of is severed. In this case, I don't think we have to do that. I think you have to ask the question, if you're going to say that this falls under the general liability policy, then what was the theory of non-vehicular conduct, negligent conduct that this insured engaged in. Well, let's say, let's say that instead of, of driving a van, uh, the employee had, had driven, a, or, or not driven, but pushed a resident in a wheelchair to a, a location near the property and, and left her in an unsafe place. Would, that would be CGL liability, right? I, that would probably be CGL liability because that wouldn't arise out of the use of a vehicle. So the, the decision fact, on where the to... The fact that, that the, this intermediate transportation occurred by motorized means as opposed to pushing means, though, 
doesn't really affect the question of where, uh, wh whether an employee's decision to leave somebody in a certain place is negligent or not. I think you have to ask what's the, in this particular fact pattern, where the allegation was that she was transported in a shuttle van, that the driver admitted his duty was to take her as part of the use of that shuttle van from as close to the door to door as possible. He made a decision on where to park that van to let her out. That is a vehicle based decision. There's no non vehicular conduct there. There's no other source of liability in the case. Um, any liability that arises out of a decision on where to park a vehicle um, and depo deposit somebody is a, a vehicle based uh, decision. Let me give you an example. If, for instance, the um, driver had dropped her in the middle of the 101 with six lanes of traffic on this side and six lanes of traffic on this side, she waits five to ten minutes, she crosses t 100 feet of traffic, and she's hit by a driver who's texting on the phone. I would contend to you that still arises out of the use of the vehicle because really? it starts the chain of causation that, that leads to her. That would not be liability under the CGL for that employee? That would um, be under the auto policy? I, I that believe argument? that would be under the auto policy. If you look at what the Supreme Court says, it only says there has to be some causal relationship. It's not proximate cause. And so you can't look at intervening and superseding causes. It does it start the chain of causation? She was put in a location based on his decision on where to park that vehicle. And because of that, she walked a certain path and slipped and fell on some ice. What if it had been really, really snowy and icy that day? And she probably shouldn't have gone at all, but he took her. And she gets a thousand feet from the drop-off point almost to the front door and falls. Would you still say that he set a, chain, a causal chain in motion? If he put her in a location where she could prove that it was unsafe for her to disembark and access the building that she told him she wanted to go to, then I think the answer to that is yes. That was the claim in the case. And well, we have to think about what's safe. The drop-off point isn't unsafe at all, but the general conditions are very unsafe. It's windy, it's raining, there's lightning, and, and you know, she gets to the safest drop-off place one could get to, but a thousand feet down the road uh, runs into trouble. Yeah, I think I think we can talk about different fact patterns. Well, this, how about this one? Yeah, I think we can talk about different fact patterns. If you're if you're saying that the driver took her to a location in which she asked to go, and it was the closest and safest location that he could get her there, and she gets out, then I think that the claim is that the driver was not negligent. It's not that it, the driver engaged in non-vehicular well, conduct. No, the claim is the driver should may have driven, you know, like Mario Andretti, just perfect drive, but shouldn't have been out that day with an elderly patient. The negligence was in taking the drive at all. In that case, would you would you say that's auto liability or CGL liability? Well, I'd ha I, you know, Your Honor, I'd really have to think about what kind of a negligence claim, the claim that you shouldn't have accepted a ride from a passenger that wanted to be driven out on the street, I, I, I think that's a difficult, I'd have to have really more facts to really understand that. I think in this particular case, we don't have to get that complex. You have to, these policies provide indemnity coverage for claims of legal liability against an insured. And the claim of legal liability here was that the vehicle was operated in a negligent manner based on the decision on where to drop her off. I'm still trying, I'm still struggling to figure out why anyone stipulated that there's liability at all uh, on, you know, that it has to be one policy or the other because it seems to me that if she was dropped off in a safe place, it's very hard for me to imagine a basis for liability under the CGL policy. But that seems to be the position we're placed in today. Well, I, I think that there's, and we talked about this in our brief, I think there's a little bit of a confusion here between coverage and liability. Nobody's asking this court to make a determination on whether she was dropped in a safe location or not. And Judge Mackey didn't make that decision. What we have, um, based on the way this case was handled, is a record of a complaint and some discovery that was done and a case that was settled. Counsel, here's the kind of the problem conceptually, though. Um, the way you've set up the agreement, and I'm not criticizing the agreement, I, but the way you've set up the agreement, if if we don't find that this uh, occurrence rose under the bodily injury coverage for the auto policy, and therefore we don't find that it's excluded under the CJL policy, your client's paying. Now, I don't know that that amounts to us finding there's coverage under the CGL policy. It's not really in front of us. 
That's the way you set up the agreement. Well, I don't know if you had a defense to coverage in your own right under the CGL policy. Yeah, the defense that we raised to coverage on the CGL policy was that it was excluded by the auto exclusion. And but, so but what, sort of, but the, the upshot of that is it's one or the other. I, I so, think you're, so I think you're you, correct, Your so, Honor. So when you raise issues about, it almost seems like you're raising a defense to maybe coverage under the CGL and why that might not be covered. And I, I don't see that before us. And I don't know whether it would be covered under your policy, but you seem to have conceded that point in the agreement. I guess I'm confused by the question, Your Honor. We have not conceded that there was coverage under the CGL policy. We're, You've conceded that you're going to pay. We've conceded that if you find that the auto exclusion does not apply, you will or pay. if Judge Mackey found that, we would pay. Right. On the but other hand, not if... That they're, not that you'll pay because there is coverage, but that you'll pay because you reached a settlement agreement. Yeah, I think maybe we're talking in cross-purposes. Um, there was never a finding of liability here. Oh, I understand. I'm yeah. just saying some of the things you're talking about seem to be defenses that you could have used for coverage under the CGL policy, um, and that's really not an issue before us today, right? And that wasn't really before Judge I think Mackey. everything that I'm arguing today, Your Honor, arg is an argument of, as to why the auto exclusion applies here and why the insuring agreement of the auto policy must respond to this settlement. Um, and I would go back to the cases and the talk about what is the causal relationship, what is the test. Can I, can I stop you there? Yeah. So you mentioned the, the Sanchez case with the, the children. Chavez. Chavez, I'm yeah. sorry, getting on the school bus. Do mm -hmm. you have any other cases that would support your position here that it was covered under the auto policy? Um, we cited Chavez, which is the school bus case. Um, I mentioned the Davis case out of North Carolina, which is the van, which dropped, uh, stopped in a location. The child crossed the street. Um, they found that arose out of the use of an auto. Uh, the other case we cited was Tobel, which is the construction truck with some lights. And I think the purpose of all these cases are you've got to look at cases that are are, are apples to apples comparisons. I think looking at drive-by shootings and other things, um, um, or looking at a negligent entrustment in an alcohol situation, uh, are not uh, really uh, helpful. You have to look at apples to apples. We've cited those cases. I think you can draw a line between Chavez and Tobel, and the Davis case and our case. And the idea is, if you're going to undertake a duty as an apartment complex to transport elderly residents to and from locations in a safe manner and as close to the door as possible, um, then the bubble of use of that vehicle is a little broader than if I just, just about deposited the, my friend somewhere. What about the Losel case? It says that the insured's mere transportation of a tortfeasor to a site where he commits a tort does not establish the requisite relationship necessary to invoke liability coverage yeah. for the use of an insured's vehicle. So the mere transportation in and of itself doesn't create that relationship where there's coverage. How would you distinguish that? So Losel, I, I think, is different from our case because we're talk there's two different principles here. One is location and one is access. And I would contend that Losel, a case of negligent entrustment, is about access. It's a liability because you're providing an intoxicated person with access to a vehicle. Um, and, the, and what the court found was that that could be done through handing them car keys, that could be done through dropping them um, near the vehicle. Our case is not about access, it's about location. It's a decision on where to drop a person and whether that was safe for that person to get into the, the location in which they're asking you to take them. And I think that is a, a key distinction uh, between the two cases. It, Losul is not a case about um, somebody being dropped in a location where it was unsafe for them to walk out of the vehicle. Um, it was about giving somebody access to, to uh, a vehicle that shouldn't have it. Um, <clears throat> I, I think the the, what I want to stress again and go back to the court, what I think is a critical issue is if the court's going to find that this is a general liability indemnity obligation, there has to be some non-vehicular conduct. But, but we're not <clears throat> finding that. You've just told me that's not what we're finding. You said the only issue before us is whether this vehicle use exclusion applies. And, and I think... When I'm saying that, I mean that, Your Honor. I mean that if you're but going to... I want you to be clear about that because yeah. I understand our directive here is not to find whether or not there's coverage under your CGL policy, but whether this exclusion applies and whether there's coverage under the auto policy. I, I agree, Your Honor. That's our coverage defense in this case is that exclusion. And so to, to state it another way and consistent with what you've said, if you're going to find that that exclusion does not apply, that decision in of itself means that there's coverage under the CGL policy. Does it? Does Correct. it mean there's coverage or does it mean that, that it triggers your 
contractual obligation to pay independent of the policy? We only asserted one coverage defense that's at issue in this appeal and at Judge Mackey's level, and that was the exclusion, that this arose out of the ownership, maintenance, use, supervision, and trustman and training of a vehicle. What we've asked Judge Mackey to do was to determine that that exclusion applied, and what we're asking you to do is to affirm that decision, that that exclusion applies. And what I want to stress, and perhaps it's my own fault for not making it clear, is that if the court is going to find that that exclusion does not apply, that is a finding that there was some non-vehicular conduct at issue, that the insured engaged in some conduct that didn't arise out of the ownership, maintenance, use, supervision, training, and trustment of a vehicle. And I would contend to you there is no evidence of the in this case that the insured engaged in any such conduct. <clears throat> Let me make one final comment um, about the complaint, because that was brought up by uh, my opposing counsel. Uh, I think that the court is bound by the complaint in a certain sense, and let me explain what I mean. I agree that factual allegations in the complaint are not necessarily binding at this stage. We had testimony. I would contend to you that that testimony is wholly consistent with what's been alleged in the complaint. Uh, as I stated, the plaintiff has always claimed, up until the time the case was settled, that she was dropped in an unsafe location. But where I think the court is bound by the complaint is in the sense of what was the legal theory of liability being asserted against the insured. And as I stated at the beginning, and I would wrap up with this, the only legal theory asserted against this insured was that the driver dropped her in a location where it was unsafe for her to disembark from a vehicle. I would leave it with that unless you have any questions. Any other questions? Do you want to go ahead? Uh, um, what about the duty to defend? Do you think, um, are there um, costs on the duty to defend, or is that a moot court? Is that a moot point at this point? Uh, there's not currently in this case any demand for defense costs or reimbursement. Um, as I understood, there was an objection at the trial court level to the form of the judgment we used, which was an order finding we owed no duty to defend or indemnify. Um, we asked for that language because it is the language that we asked for in the complaints, language the plaintiff, or excuse me, that appellant asked for. And so we use that format. We believe that's the proper format. The, the ruling on coverage in this case, whether there's a duty to defend or indemnify, is a pure legal ruling. It's not, as Mr. Richards indicated, there's not a payment obligation that's part of this case. But I would submit to you that the form of judgment submitted is accurate. It reflects the relief we requested, and uh, Judge Mackey granted it properly. Any other questions? Well, just one. I mean, the exclusion that you're relying on, is not necessarily coextensive with the coverage obligation under the auto policy. Is that, is that fair? I would say that our exclusion is broader um, than the exactly. coverage in the policy. So it's possible for your exclusion to, pl uh, to apply and for their coverage not to apply. Uh, Possibly, although I'm not, I don't think that in this particular instance that would become an issue because I don't believe that there was. Because of your agreement, it, it, it may become irrelevant. But, but as we wrestle with the case law and, and, and try and make more intuitive sense out of the, the policy language, we may be trying to do too much because you've already agreed that it's either or. Yeah. Let me, let me back up. I think I want to modify my answer to that. I think that what's different about ours is that it scoops in supervision and trustment training. So if you make a negligent supervision trustment training claim, which I don't believe was even made in our case, maybe there was a claim, um, that would be excluded by our policy. The auto policy just says bodily injury liability arising out of the use of the auto. I would submit to you that I think that if you look at the cases, and I haven't done this research, but based on my recollection, that um, a negligent supervision training claim that arises out of the UC auto would probably still trigger that. So I would modify my answer and say that there may not, they may be equal. Extensive? Yeah. Okay. Thank All you. All right, thanks. Yeah. Let me just note, Mr. Lenhart, that name, Shanks Lenhart, is a very cool name for a litigator. So I want to compliment you. That's very good. Shanks Lenhart. I'll remember that. All right. Um, Should I accept that, that Mr. Richards is not your honor? It's very, very boring. And <laughs> served you well. So, Mr. Richards? Thank it's you. Easy to say. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I, 
I, I think the argument has raised the point that I wanted to focus on, and, and uh, again, I'll just reiterate. I don't think this court has to find, oh, there was some theory of liability out there that hooks the CGL policy because of the settlement. People may settle uh, on a cost of defense basis when they don't believe there's any liability at all. And, and perhaps that creates some, some problems for uh, you people on the Court of Appeals, but I don't really think it's a problem in this case because we do have an agreement. Somebody is going to fund that settlement. And my contention is, well, my client only funds that settlement if the obligation arises out of the use of the auto, which hasn't been proved in this case. Or does, uh, well, let me go back to my last question. Are the coverage obligations under your policy and the exclusions under the CGL policy identical? in their scope? They, they are not identical in their language. As Shanks has properly pointed out, they do include, and it's an issue we raised, uh, negligent entrustment, language like that. It go, the, 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 they're not mirror images of each other, and I think in a lot of cases they have And the problem is, do, do we answer this, do, do we decide this case based on whether the CGL exclusion applies or based on whether the auto coverage is triggered? I think you decided exclusively on whether the auto coverage is triggered. They disagree. Be, because without, without the auto coverage being triggered, my client has no obligation to indemnify. Well, is that true? I mean, it, here's the problem. You, you have entered into uh, an agreement that sort of supersedes the uh, technical scope of your coverages. It is possible that you could have an insured with no coverage, but you've agreed that one of you is going to fund the settlement. And that puts us in the, in the somewhat unusual position of assuming that there is coverage, even where there may not have been. Well, and, and here's the way the issue was framed below, and I think it continues to be framed before this court, and that is We've argued, as we have, that one of the two coverages applies. We've cited to the cases and pointed the court to the language saying one of these applies. If, if, if there's a grant of coverage under one, there's an exclusion under the other. The, the problem what, is it's possible for you to both be right. It's, it's possible for them to be right that the exclusion applies, and it's possible for you to be right that there's no coverage, and yet... We've got, to, we've got to decide a case based on an agreement that says one of you is right. Except the, what I would call extra language of the exclusion is not at issue here. And that's why I think that can simply be read out of the policy. And in, in other words, this is not a case where there was negligent supervision, where that was the your, basis. Your argument is that what's before us is the language in your policy, bodily injury, arising, an accident arising out of the use of the insured auto and their exclusion, bodily injury arising out of the use of any automobile. That's all that's before us. Right. And, and that's the way the case was presented below. That's the case that was argued, or the way it was argued below. One of the problems I have, and there are cases that talk about disembarkment, and that is the point at which the auto coverage essentially leaves. I would argue we're beyond disembarkment in this case by 60 to 90 seconds by 10 to 12 feet. And I would agree with you, it, except, except I don't know if that answers the question we have to answer. Uh, that your, your disembarkment ar argument might very well get you out of coverage, but does it necessarily mean that the exclusion in the CGL policy doesn't apply? I think it does because we're beyond use of the vehicle. In other words, and, and frankly, if someone disembarks and they get out of our vehicle and we run them down, well, that's another issue. Something could occur. But once someone is disembarked in a safe location, taking those two to four steps without difficulty, we contend the auto coverage is at an end at that point. Well, what, what about the, the hypothetical that, that we heard from your colleague that um, – if you, if you drop your resident off in the middle lane of the 101 at rush hour, say, see you later, um, in, a, in a patently unsafe place, but she makes it three or four steps, let's say she makes it 10 or 12 steps and you're tootling down the road, 
Can you really say at that point that when the inevitable accident happens that there was no coverage for it? Because of the word you used, inevitable, makes it a safe location to drop her off in the first okay, place. Let's, let's, so, so, so I contend that's a different case than our case. Well, let's, yeah, I wanted to create a hypothetical where, where the, the drop-off point was pretty unsafe. And, and, and so th then you would uh, uh, concede, I think, that even if it takes a while for the accident to happen, she gets lucky and crosses four lanes of traffic safely, but the fifth lane results in an accident, by which point you're already a thousand feet down the road, there's still coverage there. That it, 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 then you can look back at it and say, we dropped her off at an unreasonable spot, we dropped her off in an unsafe location, and we contend that's not not the facts of this oh, I case. Understand. Right. But, but just for purposes of understanding the scope of the coverage, you would agree that in my hypothetical, there would be coverage. If we take away the fact you're dropped in a safe location, yeah. If you drop somebody off and there's ice right there, and they slip as they're going out of the vehicle, that's one case. Uh, if you drop them off and that spot is safe, but they have to tra uh, traipse through four or five lanes of traffic, that's an entirely different case. The problem is they have to traipse through those lanes of traffic. In this case, she had two safe avenues available to her. And, and just, I see my time's up, but my hypothetical would be, um, you know, wh where does the van coverage end? And I believe it should be disembarkment. If we have four people on the van and we drop them off at three different locations, still have one person on the van, the first person may have been dropped off two minutes ago, the second one a minute ago, the third one 10 seconds ago. Do we really have coverage at those four different locations where we're operating the van and the three where we dropped it off? Maybe not, but you might also have an exclusion at all of those locations, right? Well, not, not the way we frame the issue here. We've exclusively in the pleadings relied on the language which is reciprocal. There is coverage if it's use of a vehicle. There is not coverage if it's use of a vehicle under the CGL. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Um, we will take this matter under advisement, issue a written decision in due course. Courts in recess. Thank you.